will you commit to making sure that there is a peaceful transfer of power after the election? Well, we're going to have to see what happens. You know that I've been complaining very strongly about the ballots, and the ballots are a disaster. I and, understand that, but and, people are rioting. Do you commit oh, to making sure that there's a no, peaceful wanna, transfer of power? We want to have get rid of the ballots, and you'll have a very trans. We'll have a very peaceful. There won't be a transfer, frankly. There'll be a continuation. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And with five weeks till polling day in America, the disruptor in chief is at it again, riling up the media by suggesting he'll lead a White House mutiny if he loses the election, sending the US media into a spiral of doomsday scenarios for November. What if Trump loses but won't concede? The election that could break America. Not that anyone should be surprised. Back in July, Donald Trump was equally non-committal to the same question from Fox News. Can you give a direct answer? You will accept the election? I have to see. Look, you, I have to see. So, should we be worried about the leader of the free world barricading himself in the White House after a Joe Biden victory? Not according to a local Trumper on Sky News. The simple message that lefties want to put out there is the evil orange man is trying to steal the election. The problem for these people is they started off at 11. For four years, they've been at 11. But the United States is at 11, or perhaps even five minutes to midnight, with COVID-19 killing 200,000 people, race protests continuing, and a divided nation voting in a bitter election. And seeding doubt over the outcome, as the ABC's David Litson noted, is exactly what the president wants the media to be focusing on. My guess is that this is less a president uh, trying to uh, hold on to power, uh, seize power even if he loses the election, and more an attempt by Donald Trump to control the news agenda and have people focus on anything but his handling of the coronavirus and the state of the economy. Trump's manipulation of the media has long been masterful. As journalist Tom Tilley told ABC Radio, the progressive media and, and his progressive political opponents fall for this all the time. He's so savvy at capitalising on these moments. It's a, a slightly provocative question, so he makes the most of it by, you know, suggesting something provocative in response. And being provocative while provoking the media is what Trump loves to do. As he was in Ohio last week, complaining the media underestimate his support. These guys are bad people, I swear. They never turn the cameras around, ever. Look at them, they're just like a bunch of stiffs. Some of those stiffs have been in the line of fire, like NBC's Ali Velshi during Black Lives Matter protests earlier this year. All right, guys, I got hit. Yeah, I got hit, hold on. Let's come back out for just a minute. And did that reporter get any sympathy from the president as he celebrated the National Guard cracking down on protesters? Not a chance. He got hit on the knee with a canister of tear gas and he went down he didn't he was down my knee my knee nobody cared these guys didn't care they moved them aside and they just walked right to it was like it was the most beautiful thing in fact Velshi was hit with rubber bullets but when trump's targeting journalists facts go out of the window which of course is what he accuses the media of doing when they attack him and at another rally last week trump was at it again Sometimes they grab, they grab one guy. I'm a reporter, I'm a reporter. Get out of here. <laughs> they threw him aside like he was a little bag of popcorn. <laughs> but no, but it, I mean, honestly, when you watch the crap that we've all had to take so long, when you see that, it's actually, a, you don't want to do that, but when you see it, it's actually a beautiful sight. As Velshi pondered on Twitter, why is a journalist getting shot a beautiful thing to Trump? The answer, of course, is that it helped Trump get to the White House, and it may help keep him there. The first of three presidential debates takes place Wednesday, our time, with one of the topics listed as the integrity of the election. And you can expect Trump to make the most of that opportunity, again with help from his friends and enemies in the media. But now, let's come back home to the Australian Federal Court and last week's crazy payout for some crazy allegations. Court awards $875,000 in damages for delusional social media posts. In what must surely be a record award for social media defamation, a notorious Australian conspiracy theorist, Karen Brewer, who is now said to be in New Zealand, has been ordered to pay close to $1 million in damages for claiming that the National Party MP for Mildura, Dr Anne Webster, and her GP husband, Philip, were part of a secret pedophile ring. So, who is the accuser? Hello, Australia. My name is Karen Brewer. I am not a member of any political party, organisation or group. It's just me. 
In seven posts and videos published on Facebook in April and May, Karen Brewer accused the Websters and their charity Zoe Support, which looks after young mothers, of being part of a secretive criminal network involved in the sexual abuse of children. The claims were false and indefensible, the court found, and Brewer's conduct was disgraceful and inexplicable. Her Facebook page, which had several thousand followers, has now been taken down, but according to The Guardian, it was... A petri dish of beguiling theories and vicious abuse. With Brewer railing against... Vaccinations, flu ride and the cabal of Freemasons she believes controls Australia's parliament, judiciary, media and bureaucracy as part of an extensive pedophile protection racket. But on YouTube and BitChute, you can still get a taste of what Brewer was serving up, like this tirade against the COVID lockdown back in April. Australia, wake up. We have Scott Morrison suspending Parliament till August. Now they're running around making all sorts of fucking rules and regulations. Nobody's asking you. You're locked in your fucking homes. You know, everyone's restricted from even going down to the beach for a fucking walk. Hello? Hello? For God's sake! But Brewer's favourite topic is to allege that a host of Australian politicians, judges, policemen and journalists are pedophiles. And in videos like this one from last November, which is still up on the net, she named them and their alleged hangouts by the score. Both are pedophile HQs, I believe. Havens for politicians, members of the judiciary, business and media, an invitation only, private clubs, and all sides of politics frequent and socialise at these dens of filth. Bob Hawke was educated at Perth Modern School, Western Australia, same school and at the same time as Rolf Harris. Brewer makes some utterly crazy allegations, and while most people would just ignore them, the court found that some might take notice, and that... Social media has provided Ms Brewer with a platform by which she is able to reach suggestible individuals who may believe her claims. Hence the massive damages award. So, will the Websters ever see their money? Quite possibly not. Brewer did not defend the case or appear at the hearing. She is not rich and she's believed to be in New Zealand. But all the same, the case will have some impact. Along with the Quaden Bales defamation payout that we touched on last week, in which News Corp columnist Miranda Devine got whacked for around $200,000, it'll make it much more dangerous to smear people on social media. And that is surely a good thing. And while we're talking courts and the media, I'm sure you'll remember the high-profile criminal case in which a former Sydney schoolteacher, Chris Dawson, is accused of murdering his wife, Lynette, four decades ago. Chris Dawson appeared via video link in central local court wearing the same clothes uh, he was extradited in. 37 years after his former wife Lynette Dawson disappeared from their Bayview home, uh, his arrest in Queensland, his extradition to New South Wales and that charge of murdering Lynette Dawson. The startling news on Friday was that his trial has been put off until at least June next year, which means eight more months of waiting, eight more months of memories fading, and even worse, perhaps, of witnesses dying. So why is the court taking this extraordinary step? Because Dawson's right to a fair trial has been threatened by a hugely popular true crime podcast from 2018, which has been downloaded more than 50 million times. And in her judgment, handed down this month, Justice Elizabeth Fullerton did not hold back in explaining why it posed a problem. Her Honour was left in no doubt that the adverse publicity in this case, or more accurately, the unrestrained and uncensored public commentary about Lynette Dawson's suspected murder, is the most egregious example of media interference with a criminal trial process. So, will another eight months make all that prejudicial pre-trial publicity go away? In our view, it's unlikely, which is why two years ago, when Dawson was charged, Media Watch suggested a trial by judge alone might be the way to go. But in the meantime, for reporters like the podcast author, investigating cold case crimes, there was this stern warning from Justice Fullerton. A journalist who assumes the role of an investigative journalist or the role of a narrator of a podcast, and who either ignores the potential impact of that commentary on the integrity of a police investigation, or the impact of that commentary on a future trial in a case where a person is ultimately charged, will do so at their peril. Strong words, which will rattle the media's cage. I wonder if there'll be a response. 
But now to the property website Domain, which was forced to eat humble pie three weeks ago as MediaWatch revealed that one of its journalists had invented quotes and sources at least 11 times, leading to this grovelling apology. We are really disappointed by this. This is not the standard we expect. But after Domain took down all that journalist stories, we found another stuff up on their website last week with this inspirational tale of a young first home buyer. Adam Guala, 25, doesn't do things by halves. He's just emancipated himself from the rental market by buying not one, but two properties in Geelong. Yes, what a guy and what a role model. A 25-year-old buying not one, but two properties off the plan. And the story went on to quote happy young Adam with his two contracts of sale, explaining his strategy for those who want to copy his success. My options were limited as a young first home buyer. So I have bought two off the plan apartments with my mum to convert into one larger property. It's nice to be able to do this with my mum, who is a keen property investor. The story also had helpful tips for renters wanting to buy. If you have a deposit ready, there's no harm in letting your property manager know you want to buy the place you're renting. Suggests Nick Cooney, founder of Estate Agency. So what was the problem? Well, the story forgot to mention a couple of things. First, that Adam, is a real estate agent. Second, that he and Nick Cooney are selling the properties that Adam purchased in the Rari Home Apartments in Geelong, as you can see on Nick's Instagram page. And on realestate.com.au, you'll find Nick and Adam listed as the selling agents. Whoops. So, Domain's fabulous You Can Do It story is nothing but a giant ad for the Geelong development. And did Domain eventually acknowledge that? Well, yes, but only after business blogger David Llewellyn Smith had alerted us whereupon readers were belatedly told that Adam, quote, has since started working for the developer of the project Franz Developments in a sales role. Nick Cooney's relationship to Franz Developments, he is the sales director, has also been updated. So we asked Nine, Domain's majority shareholder, what happened? And they told us... At the time of publishing, the reporter was not aware of the individual's links with the Ryrie Home Project. As soon as Domain was made aware, we included this information in the story in the interests of transparency. What? Seriously? Haven't they heard of checking before publication? Apparently not. But now, some brighter news and a newspaper that has come back from the dead. Last month we showed you this emotional sign-off from journalist Raquel Mustillo at the Border Watch newspaper in Mount Gambia, South Australia. You know, we survived wars, we survived depression, we survived, you know, just catastrophic things that have happened to this region, but, you know, we could not survive this and live that, you know, on behalf of the entire Border Watch to our community. I am so sorry. This being the COVID hit recession and, of course, the massive decline in print advertising. On 21st of August, the Border Watch printed what it called its final edition, thanking readers for 159 years of support. But last Wednesday, the paper's Facebook page lurched back to life. We're back. We're delighted to announce the Border Watch will resume printing on October 16. The new owners are a partnership of independent newspaper proprietors from South Australia and Victoria. Editor Brett Kennedy is back on the job and he told ABC Radio the local community has celebrated the return. When the closure did have an outpouring of support from the community was, um, was quite touching and, um, and now to, you know, to bring it back and to still see that people um, value its presence in the community. Um, we're certainly going to push us forward and, and, you know, strive for the best that we can be. So, how will the new owners make it work? Well, they'll only print a weekly edition for now, and they'll draw on their own publishing operations in South Australia and the Eastern States to get economies in production, printing, subscriptions and sales. One of them, Paul Thomas, has a network of suburban and regional papers in Victoria under the Star Group. And in the last few months, he has successfully launched new papers in the Queensland regional centres of Bundaberg, Rockhampton, Gympie, and South Burnett, filling the hole left by News Corp, closing its print titles there. He'll add the Border Watch to his centralised production and sales hubs, thus driving down admin costs to keep journalists on the beat, and he's confident the paper will survive. It's a hard slog, don't get me wrong. It's not easy, but it can be done. You can bring communities with you. It's still an important part of the marketing mix for businesses, and it's still important from a community perspective. So, after the heartbreak of closure, readers in South Australia's South East will now enjoy a new age of media competition. A new weekly, the SE Voice, launched this month to cover the wider region and sold almost 6,000 copies on debut. 
And next month, News Corp will launch the digital-only Mount Gambia News to go up against the border watch. Meanwhile, an hour north in Narracourt, the presses have restarted at ACM's the Narracourt Herald to take on the new local paper, the Narracourt Community News. Both are said to be growing their subscriptions base. And we hope they will prosper well into the future. That's all from us tonight. There's more on our website where you can read a statement from Domain. And don't forget, Media Bytes every Thursday on your favourite social media platform. But for now until next week, goodbye. Mm -hmm.